Hey, it's E.B. Moss, and this is episode 10 of season two of Insider Interviews, which always gives you the insider scoop on the business of media, marketing, and advertising. And for this episode, we're going to hear from three different experts about how audio should be approached holistically and what that means, because I'm not sure, but I know it doesn't have anything to do with an organic diet. I'm recording this in Denver during the biggest podcast conference of the year. It's called Podcast Movement. And I pulled three folks from the sea of 3,000 creators, producers, sellers, engineers, and talent to talk to me today. And I'm very fortunate to speak with the founder of Sounds Profitable, Brian Barletta, the chief insights officer of Signal Hill Insights, Paul Reismandel, and the executive vice president of audio company Odyssey, Ken Lagana. Here we go. Hey, Brian, I'm going to fawn about you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I always fawn about you, but I wanted to warn you. I appreciate it. All right. So uh, this is what I know. Sounds Profitable, your company, has been making serious waves in audio. Get it? Waves audio? <laughs> okay. Uh, you've got advisory services that help podcasters grow their audience and revenue. Um, I spoke with you about three years ago when you were just launching your vision to share content and build partnerships, and now it's a reality. Yay. And speaking of partnerships, I should mention Tom Webster, who was also on an earlier episode of Insider Interviews, and he joined your team, I think, just last year? Yep, a little over a year ago. Yeah, so as of today, we have about 142 partners. And it's amazing. I believe partners of sounds profitable. partners of sounds profitable. Oh my gosh! Right, and I I believe we might be the largest in that realm of uh, organizations for professional enterprise level companies in podcasting. Oh, awesome! And Tom just presented some industry changing research here at Podcast Movement. So together, I here's the fawning part. You are generous, smart helpful, and as you like to say, killing it. <laughs> I appreciate it. And helping podcasters kill it. I'm so happy to talk to you officially. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. It's fun. It's all exciting. And there's a lot of really positive energy here. I, I have a lot of optimism for what comes out of this event. Brian, it's, it's a big conference. And I know that you have had back-to-back -back meetings. You have a huge booth here. I do. Right? Too big. So what's, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so what is Sounds Profitable doing at that booth? What's going on? Yes, the venue that we're at right now, me and you found mm -hmm. an empty room. Yeah. Which, which is, is wild. <laughs> but if someone, you met up with someone and you were just saw a panel and then you needed to go meet them in the lobby, it's like a 10 minute walk. Yeah. So we have decided that at Podcast Movement, and evolutions in primary going forward, we want to carve out a space where our partners and their guests can get a quick break, sit down, collect their thoughts, or hold meetings mm -hmm. right where everybody is, right? And so we carpeted it, which was insanely expensive. But <laughs> well, we've got to absorb the sound. Exactly, exactly. And it's got all, all the trappings to make it so that people can have a nice, quiet conversation in there. And, and then we do panels there midday, every yep. day. and. I think it, it kind of fits with our mindset of how do we just solve everybody's problems? How do we come together and use collective purchasing and, and bargaining and all that to yeah. just say like, we need this. We need a little bit extra room and just- Well, let's talk about solving people's problems. You started this three years ago? Be, yeah, September is the official anniversary. And so that'll be three, three years. years. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I'm not your mother, but I'm so <laughs> proud of you. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, we talked right when it kicked off we and did. I, I didn't know what this could become. What's the what of Sounds Profitable? What did you set out to build? Yeah. Okay. The joke initially is that it was how I found my next job and then it became my next job. So I guess I succeeded. There was a lack of, and we're going to use this word a lot today, holistic podcast content material stuff 
for the people in the business. There's a ton of stuff out there for the people who create. There's a ton of stuff up there for the people who do workshops and produce on the prosumer level, even to the mid-tier. But for the mid to enterprise, for the people who cash a paycheck in this space, the people who are passionate and want their career in this space on the business side. Yeah. And those people enable the creatives to go do the right. cool creative yes, things they do. We, do. we have a lack of resources. We have a lot of places asking from us and not giving, and we don't have a place where we can call home. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of the mission, right? That for Sounds Profitable, I want everybody we work with to feel ownership in it, that it helps them achieve their goals of educating their teams, getting the whole industry on the same page, and pushing the right narrative forward so that we don't get beat up by other spaces or other people looking to kind of take more from us. And I mean, I think that the truth of it is, is there are too many organizations out there that are not doing enough for podcasting, mm -hmm. but are charging us the yep. same way that they charge CTV, a digital display, heck, even out of home. And podcasting needs a place to ground it and yeah. say like, here's fair costs for this. Here's fair value. Here's an exchange of it. Here's the right people in the right rooms. The, the ability to be that glue that pulls people together to collectively represent all of our partners, not even just the ones in the IAB, at the IAB Tech Lab meetings and mm -hmm. things like that. Pull everybody together and make sure that any partner of any size can get in front of the right people, whether they're other publishers, ad tech partners, agencies or advertisers. So that's our mindset that we, we believe we have a good sight on what the industry needs and we are not going to wait for someone else to pay for it. We're going to push ahead and do it. I get it, okay. And you described it as having a home for all people in the podcasting space, not just a select few. And that's why you added carpet to your booth. <laughs> Make it home. Yep. Okay, maybe not. Um, so you did that and you did it well and you started to grow and you started to educate the industry and then you yeah, brought a partner in. Tell I, us about that. Yeah, the face of podcast research, Tom yeah. Webster. I you know, learned a lot from his newsletter and his presentations and emulated a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So when Tom came over from Edison Research, I said, if we have the ability to to do better by the space, which is our research, right? That's a, that's a big thing there. We decided we were doing our research. We committed financially to it. We started doing it. And then we sought out people to come participate with us on it. But even if everybody said no, we knew that it was valuable to have that research. We knew that the industry would be, be better from it. So I really felt like a lot of the research that we have in this space is either the same thing we've been doing for 20 years because it's good to build trends and I'm very thankful for Edison to do that or things that were only driven because one or more people paid for it. And I know that the other side of that, unfortunately, is that if you those people pay for it and it didn't get the right results, they might just tank it. Oh. So we knew that there were questions that could be asked in a way that could empower everybody, not mm -hmm. just our partners, but literally everybody in podcasting to take that slide and answer that question. You know, the podcast creators yeah. was our first report that we did. And there are a substantial amount of people who tell me that that's in their decks when they go pitching for funding or for for someone to do ad sales for them or for a green light, a new show. And and that's really exciting. We yeah. want to provide something that allows somebody to further their business. And new findings or research is being shared here at Podcast Movement. Yeah. At these events, we really focus on who's here and in the crowd, and we tailor the content for that. So his keynote is very much for the audience here, both business and prosumers, I would say is the right term for them. What's neat is we have so much data that we might actually be able to pull a second report out of it. Ooh. That uh, is a, a view of the American podcast listener. It's about perceptions of podcasting, podcasters, podcasts themselves. It's a deeper look into churn. And because we continue to talk about growth and people will say things like podcast listening is up 3% this year. Yeah. Well, was it just up three or was it actually up 12, but a churn of 9%? And the thing, oh. right, the thing I want to get more people thinking about, and Tom really opened my eyes to this, is that we look a lot at these reports and they say, there's so many people that say, I just started listening to podcasting in the last six months, but that trend line keeps going up. Yeah. So if that number keeps getting bigger of, I just started listening in the last six months, we're losing people who listened a long time ago. So that's uh, going to be really interesting yeah. to figure this out. And we're hoping that the future of our research can help people look at every other research in podcasting through a different lens 
combine them and apply them and really find out new and interesting things. You are like the walking wiki. <laughs> As a Tom's got the research stuff way, way better. He is, he the, is the, the best, best presenter of research. It's wild, he, right? He's a storyteller. Well, he was like a literature professor yeah. too, which is so ironic. Anyway, I want to thank you for teeing me up with the word holistic. And that's the theme of this episode. Um, but what does that mean? What's a holistic approach to podcasting? I think that it's very easy to look at podcasting as just audio. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very easy for people to bring their content from radio or their ads from radio or to try and run the same ads and content between like streaming radio and streaming audio and podcasting. And uh, heck, I even think that there's a lot of people in podcasting whose entire goal is to make an IP in podcasting, quickly prove it, and then option it out elsewhere. Oh. And that's not bad. I mean, cool on them business-wise of yeah. being able to prove it out. But I think the holistic approach to podcasting and the, we're entering the why phase is is why podcasting, why uniquely podcasting, why start here, why everything that is here should be about here. Like you can do video podcasting and to me that's very different than doing YouTube, right? Because if you come at it from a holistic podcast approach, and then you bring it to YouTube, that's gonna be very different than if you just had a YouTube show and you're just like, well, let's just pull the audio over. Right. Right? And so it's so funny to be like 20 years into an industry and be like, I think we're about to hit 2.0. <laughs> like, I think that's the truth of it. Like the ad tech, the mindset, the education is there. And that's, we, we need to treat it as its own channel and not try and tag it onto other channels to find its own value. Okay. Um, so you have really deep chops in audio, kind of holistically as well. You were at Barometric and you were at Megaphone and you are a tech expert, but you also really understand the business of podcasting. So now what are you most excited about that you've seen evolve and what do you want to see evolve more? I'm going to say awareness. I think the success that podcasting has had has been good and bad. I think that during the boom, during the pandemic, things moved really fast. I think there were a lot of people who are already unqualified to have raised money or to have run a business. I think those people then went out and looked at their numbers going through the roof and then just redid their projections for five years with the assumptions that this growth would continue. And I think we overhired. Companies that were just building podcasts were now marketing podcasts and doing ad sales and all these things. And I think we, we stretched ourselves too thin. And when people think about Spotify, they're so negative about it. They're like, ah, Spotify burned all this money. I'm thankful for it. I think they bought us five years of knowledge in yes. one year. Yes. You know, they taught us the podcast players are more like web browsers than they are like Netflix or HBO. You have a specific podcast player that you use and you may be lured out to go listen somewhere else, but probably not. And it's probably not gonna change your habits. Yep. So you need to use your tool to access it everywhere. And so this awareness that maybe we're not completely unique, maybe we need to have some knowledge of the other spaces that are booming like CTV and all that. Maybe we need to get seasoned salespeople in here knocking on doors and maybe we need to double down on what makes podcasting unique instead of just bringing everything that can have an audio component to podcasting. And that's what it feels like we're doing right now. People are really refining it. Shows that had five episodes a week are reevaluating, do they need to do that? Can they be more efficient with two? Can it be better quality content? right we're seeing networks consolidate certain things we're seeing ad tech advance in different ways and we're seeing the sellers understand that at the end of the day our goal is to service the buyers and if they would like to buy even integrated or baked in ads then we need to make room for them mm -hmm. because it is our job to make this industry grow not our job to say well we've decided we don't do that anymore because yeah. we've implemented some new technology. Right. So so awareness, I think, I think we're gonna go through our humble phase coming up. And in terms of that efficiency with advertising in particular, there's a lot of buzz around programmatic audio and podcasting. Where are we as an industry with that? And will that 
be good or bad? Will it cannibalize our uniqueness? Yeah, so the the middle area is the worst part about it, right? Where you have plenty of unsold inventory, programmatic is up there, the demand isn't that high, and the technology isn't built to make things compete against each other. That's the scary area, because that means that you're selling direct sold at, let's say, $25, and then you're getting programmatic at maybe five to $12 CPM, but you still have available inventory. So the people who bought you direct, your fear is that they're gonna to wanna to switch to programmatic, mm. but that's only a temporary period of time. First off, there's more you can do with that host red, endorsed creative that differentiates it and it allows you to have that unique sound. But second, at some point, more and more buyers are gonna get into the space. I just accepted a position as the chair of the pre-bid committee for audio and when that comes into play, it connects us to over 250 demand and supply sources for like programmatic which means we're gonna be able to open ourselves up as an industry to even more demand sources and have everybody compete head to head. And when they compete head to head, that means prices rise. And when they compete, it means there's less available inventory because they're fighting for those ideal impressions. So the prices rise and they settle. Now, I think that CPMs will drop a little bit on some sides and raise on others, but we are definitely in that awkward teenage phase. And so the tech can be scary and programmatic can be scary, but I think that it is a buyer's market right now. And I think that the tech that's coming out that really impresses me are around buyer safety, verification, brand safety and suitability, all of those things. And that's how we need to tell this buyer that can easily just throw their whole budget in CTV, spend a little bit on Spotify and call it audio. We need to convince them like, hey, we can keep you safe. We can get you great results and we can make this worth you putting that effort to learn that. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, they don't owe us anything. So I'm going to end with a curveball, which is that with political advertising, uh, linear TV in particular is really facing a demise of viewership, and yet something like 56% of the local advertising for political campaigns went to linear TV, and you know how much went to radio? How much? 5.4%, according to a, a Nielsen survey. Now that's radio, AM, FM, you know, how's it doing, et cetera. And we're going to talk to Odyssey uh, a little bit later on too. But do you think that podcasting has an opportunity to fill in those blanks? Is programmatic not as robust yet where we can put in short-term campaigns that are not baked in? What do you think about political as a vertical for podcasting, advertising? I think for political advertising and political content in general, I think podcasting is fantastic because so many of those people with voices that are out there are good enough to be a podcast host, to be interviewed on places. So I think they can get a lot of organic reach. I think the advertising and podcasting for political campaigns has opened up a little bit more, but people aren't spending enough, so the prices can be high. Programmatic and other things are great, but it's very easy to alienate your audience that way. Um, you don't know if this listener wants to listen to a political ad when you're in the middle of listening to your favorite audio drama. So I think that we'll see an influx of podcasts taking political ads, and then I think we'll see a lot of people block it. And the ones that do keep it, I think will do really well but I think we're gonna see more of a holistic approach. I think we're gonna see more guesting and hosting of shows because it, it's almost worth it more. I, w I would rather, if I was running a political campaign, create a branded podcast and put my money into marketing my podcasts because that ad pushes my campaign and my podcast, mm -hmm. and that's a killer model. But as broadcast television declines right on viewership, people who are there are the people who consistently turn out and vote. Yeah. And when you're, you know, the DNC or the RNC, and you can buy across an entire scale. network, and you, yeah, exactly, with scale, and those prices are already going down. Yeah. How easy is it to make sure that there's nothing on TV except pharma ads and political ads during oh a political God. cycle? What a brilliant answer! <laughs> you had no idea I was going to ask you that. That was awesome, and it, it really. You brought up such important points too about contextual targeting uh, and is it appropriate within the show and selectivity and being true to your audience and picking and choosing yeah. what you'll accept, even if it's doable. 
Well, I, so I'm going to throw a question back at you. Uh-oh. Would you allow political ads in the show? Only if it was for my party. <laughs> yeah, but that's a great answer. But that's a great but answer. But I don't know what my audience sure. would respond to. That's and me that, personally. And, and but that's so difficult because there's no filters that would yep. like you would have to do that as direct. We that's couldn't right. do that as programmatic. There's no like what's the affiliation under political for yeah. blocking it out. It's political or no. It's a it's a slippery slope, and everybody's got to ask themselves that. The best thing I can say yeah. is everybody listening who has a podcast or a YouTube channel or whatever reevaluate what you want to like get through in this cycle and from the mind of the wiki master <laughs> <laughs> what a great note to end it on we learned a lot just now brian thank, thank you. you so much brian barletta sounds profitable thank you so the audio analysis experts at signal hill insights always advocate for holistic campaign measurement versus siloed or strictly performance-driven approaches. And their brand lift studies have really been able to spotlight some things like creative and planning to uncover why a campaign succeeds or stumbles. So next up, I'm gonna be chatting with Chief Insights Officer, get it, Signal Hill Insights Chief Insights Officer, Paul Reese Mandel, <laughs> about how to optimize podcast and streaming campaigns in this episode of Insider Interviews. Hello, Paul. Hey, B. <laughs> um, so I want to say we're here at Podcast Movement, so we have a little bit of ambient noise here mm -hmm. at the Denver Conference Center. But you did an amazing panel at Podcast Movement. I, I feel like you should have run off the stage <laughs> saying, now I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> Thank you. How do you feel? I feel good. Good. <laughs> well, we learned a lot about best practices in campaign measurement, and hopefully you'll share a little bit about that. But I, I really want to give you a proper intro. Um, so you and Jeff Vidler are the chiefs of Signal <laughs> yes. Hill Insights. Partners. Partners, yes. chiefs. All right. In my mind, you're chiefs. Um, mm. And you joined earlier this year, as I mentioned earlier, as chief insights officer. And that's appropriate because you led the insights team at podcast companies, right? Like Midroll, yes, Stitcher? Yes, Midroll Media, one of the original ad reps in the podcast industry, uh, beginning in 2014. And, and at that point, it really wasn't an insights role because we didn't know we needed an insights role. <laughs> but I was in uh, B2B marketing, helping to explain to advertisers and brands why they needed to buy podcast ads, Love which that. also meant explaining what a podcast ad was. And very quickly, it turned into, well, it's it's actually kind of a research problem uh huh. because, you know, we, we could talk about how intimate podcasts are and how well they work. And inevitably, someone asked you to prove it. And so we went on the path of proving it. So it was there at Midroll, which became Stitcher. May it rest in peace. Yeah. Well, the, the brand is alive, even okay. though the app has gone away at this point. Um, and then we were acquired by SiriusXM. So I spent two years uh, working within the sales research team on Podcast Insights. Yeah. So you're like uh, the OG of this <laughs> space, I think. And we're, we're very, very lucky to have you. You do really share great insights. And um, I know together with the rest of your team, including, believe it or not, one of my former coworkers, Grace Carrick, just joined you recently. Yes. Right? You guys are the, the audio analysis experts, I think. Um, now, I know a thing or two about analysis, mm -hmm. but mine is the kind where you lie down on a couch. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you advocate for holistic campaign measurement. So I want you to tell me what that is. Sure. I mean, really, it's trying to look at all the components of an audio ad campaign. So wherever possible, we like to go to an advertiser or a brand and try and bring together all of their placements, right? So often they're working with multiple networks, multiple shows, maybe multiple channels, have streaming and podcasts and, and measure it all together. Mm -hmm. Measure it all together because we can make sure that we're unifying all the metrics across the board. So we can really have an apples to apples comparison. And that means apples to apples understand how did streaming perform versus podcast, understand how um, different publishers might have performed or different shows. But also then when we're aggregating everything together, we get to get at other insights that might be obscured if you're only measuring this publisher or only measuring this publisher. 
Look at how audiences are responding. How are personas responding? You know, look at, is it women responding differently than men? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you have gamers mm -hmm. who are responding differently than folks who are not gamers, who are sports fans. We can dig into all sorts of different things that might be obscured. Often in podcasting, really, it's like, well, this show did well and this show didn't do well. But maybe it's a more nuanced conversation because maybe it's because simply there's more gamers uh -huh. listening to that show and we didn't know that. And that's really where the response was to that messaging. Yeah. And so you can, you can really start to pull it apart and say, okay, well, one, there's a reach opportunity. We didn't know we wanted shows that have gamers. Well, let's go find more shows and placements that reach gamers. Yeah. Two then, okay, the messaging didn't work with maybe the, the sports fans. Well, how do we work with that? How do we take the message and maybe massage it so that it's responding more, so that we're continuing to use these insights actually to grow reach, which is very often one of the uh, top objectives of right. podcast advertisers. Uh, so I have so many things to ask about that. So we're talking now within the world of audio, mm -hmm. um, streaming, audio, podcast, et cetera. Does this also apply um, apples to apples measurement with linear, like radio broadcast or no? This is all digital. It's audio. mostly digital. Okay. Um, and because basically, you know, there are methodological reasons why we can measure digital one way and sort of say at least linear broadcast radio differently. Okay. Uh, but we could consider streaming radio as That's digital, right. That's right? right? So we could definitely bring in streaming radio advertising campaigns into the same holistic measurement. This is your core competency, but what's the elevator pitch for Single Hill Insights? Well, look, we, we play on your team. Okay, so what we're looking to do is to figure out what are the insights that you need. Um, if you're an advertiser or a brand, you know, what is the KPI? What are we hoping to inform you here and make sure that the analysis is going to do that? Um, that's not always necessarily well covered by a, just an off-the-shelf mm -hmm. kind of product, right? And as well, if you're a publisher, it's a similar sort of approach. And we might be working with your unique circumstances, your, your unique ad tech, your shows. Are you, you know, if your podcasts, are you doing baked in? Are you doing DAI? Are we looking at programmatic? And all of these different variables and making sure that we're covering the bases that you need covered. And, and still to do it in a way, though, that is holistic and consistent so you know what to expect. And you're getting ultimately usable insights, I right? See. Very often. You know, studies are done and it checks a box. It's a report card and it's very nice. You know, uh, little Janie got A's this, this year. Very nice. Uh -huh. And we, we put the report card away and that's fine and good. The work here is done. The work here is done. But what I've seen the smartest advertisers do is to take the results of a brand list study and use that to optimize, to, to look at those insights and say, okay, Maybe your messaging is hitting home, so it's just, let's do the same thing. Or maybe where it isn't hitting home, looking at how is the messaging jiving with different audiences. Again, looking for reach opportunities very often. It works well with this audience. We'll report, can we find more of that audience and grow our reach? Because sometimes it's not always obvious on the surface, right? It's not always as simple as, okay, well, we know this show has always worked for us. Yeah. I mean, that's great. Right. But we can get out well, why so that you, you're not having to just only go to this one show, but maybe there's, there's a grand variety of podcasts out there that an advertiser could take advantage of. Well, let's go back to the concept of brand lift. Mm -hmm. I, I know that that's sort of your middle name at <laughs> uh, Signal Hill Insights, at and Holistic. Um, but let's make sure that we define that too, because what I'm hearing you say so far is that Signal Hill Insights... Um, really customizes the approach to create the methodology or the process for gathering data that is based on the specific needs and goals of an advertiser. Mm -hmm. But you also really specialize in studies about brand lift, which right. is... Yeah, so brand, yeah. brand lift <laughs> measures the influence or impact of a campaign on the consumer's perception of the brand. Ultimately, that's it, right? So when we talk about a lot of upper funnel measures, you're talking something like awareness or favorability. It's understanding. Do I know this brand? Do I know that this brand is 
in this product category? Do I associate them with that? How do I feel about the brand? And we're measuring what is the difference in that uh, feeling and that perception, that knowledge about the brand okay. as a result of the ad exposure as compared to somebody who didn't hear that ad. Yep. Right. And that's the lift. So we might say, folks who heard this ad campaign, um, 65% are aware of this particular product. Podcast listeners who did not hear that campaign, that's only 30%, right? We say we the lift of 35%. We're really measuring that's the impact because th this part of the funnel is not measured in actions. It's people's awareness, what they sentiment, know. And so we're asking them sentiment, quali qualitative, I right? See. And then getting at, do you, do you associate this message with this brand? Do you agree with these different messages about the brand? Often that's things that are inside of the ad, right? You might say this mayonnaise is the creamiest. It's the tastiest. Well, do you associate creamy with this mayonnaise? And you could say, well, well of course someone would, but that's why we do the lift. Mm -hmm. We compare someone who heard the ad versus someone who didn't hear the ad. And if we see positive change, a positive difference that someone who heard the ad and is really hundreds of someone's who heard the ad have more favorability remember more about the brand or say they're more likely to consider or even purchase it, right? We call that yeah. the lift, the lift that we can attribute to being exposed to the ad. Got it. So then you are assessing brand lift, the increase in favorability, awareness, perception, et cetera. And that your uh, evangelizing is best achieved brand lift with a holistic approach to podcast advertising. Absolutely, yes? yes. Yes. I love it when I get it. <laughs> I hope everybody else gets it. Um, okay. So let's talk about like some of the changes in the podcast industry. You've been talking a lot about the need to focus on ad creative. Mm -hmm. Why is that different now than, I mean, it's a young industry, but even so. You know, so... If we dial back to 2014. The serial days. <laughs> the serial days. Well, and, and even people remember from the day of those days, MailChimp. Yes. Right. And he's really uh, As well. As MailChimp for those who right, you know, exactly, weren't right? listening yet. And they weren't even like host reads. They were these well-crafted, like little tiny audio documentaries within a documentary. Yep. And there was a lot of that in podcasts. And even if you weren't doing something quite so cute and artful, Nevertheless, like the, a much of the dominant mode is what we call the host read. And I remember the Earwolf days working yep. around the Earwolf network. And if you'd see them handing the ad reads to Scott Ackerman before he goes to <laughs> Comedy Bang Bang. He takes a minute and he pulls out the paper and he does his host read right then and there, mm -hmm. right? Baked in. And it was just the flow. We didn't have sophisticated ad tech. And so... It was very organic. It was very organic in podcasts. And so the creative became very much associated with the host read. Um, was wonderful, probably responsible for a lot of the ways in which podcast ads outperform so many other channels, but we kind of took it for granted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now things are changing. Yeah. We have ad tech, which means we don't have to do the host reads in that way. It means, uh, that we have dynamic ad insertion. It was a great technology. DAI. Opens up a lot uh, more opportunities for both advertisers and publishers and podcasters. Now we have programmatic where the transactions can happen on someone's screen. Instead of calling their ad rep and filing, you know, a, a request, it's just on all online. Upload your audio creative and mm. off you go. So now we have the opportunity for all sorts of ad creatives to be in there. And that's an opportunity and a risk. Because I don't know that we as an industry have had that opportunity to take that step back and double check. Well, why? Do podcast ads work as well mm -hmm. as they do? Then research has been done around a lot of this, right? And thinking about the platform, but really uncovering it's it's the creative because that's what listeners hear. I, I, I want to <laughs> embroider that on a pillow. It's the creative, stupid. Yeah, it's what <laughs> people hear. Yeah, you know. And so, why should that be divorced from the channel itself? Or my other question. Creed. Is it reasonable to expect a radio ad put in a podcast should perform better than it does on radio? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. 
And I think it's a point where we really need to lean into this analysis because the risk, I think, is for podcasting to accidentally lose that je ne sais quoi. A podcast. The, 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 exactly. The thing that made, that made it special. And I'm pretty convinced it's the ad creative. And it's not the ad creative alone. The ad creative is not in a vacuum. It's our experience of how we listen. It's in a show. Yeah. Right? And so going back to the host read, it's the host reading the ad within their show feels very organic. And it's very, very different than, than broadcast radio. It's mm -hmm. different than streaming, mm -hmm. right? Streaming is music. And then you have an ad, which is decidedly not music most of the time. And we sort of established a norm that was in some ways sort of hard to scale. So yeah. we brought technology to help to scale. Well, now I think we need to sort of scale that understanding of the ad creative. And I'm not here to say, oh, it's all host reads. Yeah. In fact, I know that's not true because I've measured Like campaigns. a beautifully produced spot can be as effective as that organic and, host and read. And even like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have heard lovely announcer reads and all that makes it lovely is the copy was good. Mm -hmm. And the person has a nice voice. And I've seen those in some cases outperform host reads, but that was not an expensive ad to produce. It just was good. And that's why brand lift and doing this holistically comes to the fore, mm -hmm. right? Because it, going back to this idea of thinking, well, will this show outperform that show? I want to ask what was different about the ads? Right. Was there something different about the ads? Or did you use the same ad on both? And those are a lot of questions to ask. And we, we can ask them and we can begin to answer them so that we can get at this. How do you optimize, right? Because I do think optimization is really key for success and su success for the advertiser, but for success for the publishers. Because I think looking at the creative is the difference between a $12 and a $25 CPM. Excellent, excellent. Paul, to kind of bring it home, if you had a wish list for what you would love to see the industry embrace more of or technology you think would move us forward, what would it be? I would love to see the industry invest in really discovering and establishing true creative best practices. And you do that through research. Obviously, I'm here to Ooh, do that. Like I'm very BBC happy to do Hill that. Insight. Okay. I, th I think that, that now more than ever is that moment. And I mean, we can ask, we could go through this room here and talk to so many amazing, talented, smart podcast people, ask them what makes the best podcast ad, yeah. right? And I don't think any of them is wrong. I don't know that they're right. <laughs> I love that. So... We have to find out. We have hypotheses, right? right? And if you talk to some really successful performance advertisers, they've done a lot of that work for their brand and they know for their brand and their vertical. And I don't think this is actually this enormous multifaceted research program, but I think there are hypotheses we can test, such as my biggest hypothesis is that podcast ads have to hold your attention while radio and streaming have to grab your attention. The ad is probably better matching the context mm -hmm. than blaring at you. Pretty sure I'm right. Would love to test it. I always think you're right. Paul Reese Mandel, <laughs> Chief Insights Officer of Signal Hill Insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. More to come. All righty, we are doing the third in the three segments here from Podcast Movement, and I am really happy to have another OG in the Gosh, audio space. that makes space. me sound so old. <laughs> OG. That's what O stands I for. I know, I know, but hearing it makes it worse. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ken Lagana. Ken is the Executive Vice President of Digital Sales at Odyssey. That's why you get that title. Yes. Yes. And you, when you get old, you, you get that title. <laughs> well, you're an industry veteran. Um, what, a couple decades in digital audio. You were you were at Odyssey before well, Odyssey was Odyssey. I, I, exactly. I was at Odyssey when we were still Entercom. Um, previous to that, I really cut my teeth at, at Megaphone. 
um, Panoply, and then we rebranded to Megaphone. So it's been it's been about nine years in digital audio. Yeah. And it's been a fantastic nine years. Well, they are very lucky to have you. I appreciate that. You were also SVP at CBS Digital Media before yeah. that. So what have you seen happen in the in the industry that led us up to podcasting getting on the map? Yeah, well, it's it's really it's amazing when when I think about it, really um, almost 22 years at CBS and at the foundational level of digital video and you know, there are so many similarities and so many of the same types of challenges and opportunities that we had in digital video that now ring true in, in digital audio. And the, the evolution was literally like almost the same thing in terms of advertiser adoption, in terms of challenges, in terms of brand safety, in terms of how we evolved to um, programmatic. And a lot of the things that I saw in digital video, we're, we're sort of reliving in the digital audio space, which is nice to some degree because I felt like I'd been there, done that before. Yeah. But obviously, you know, with different media and mediums, there's different challenges, even though you may know what to do, the how to do it, um, the technology is different. So yeah, I mean, every day is an adventure, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you espouse being platform agnostic. Yes. About audio. Um, you know, you do radio, you yep. do podcasting, the whole McGilla. Live events. Live. Oh, see? Yeah. There, there we go. Yeah. So you guys are the ones who suggested a theme for this episode of the holistic approach to podcasting. So tell me more about Odyssey. Sure. Um, and you call yourselves a network. And then tell me about sure. your holistic approach. Sure. So Odyssey is an audio first digital audio and entertainment company. Um, as we, we just mentioned, we have over 200 radio stations across the country wow. in every major market. Um, depending upon what research uh, you look at, we're either the second or third largest podcast network in the marketplace. And we do some really nice live events that are, that are with some of the biggest names in the music industry. And so when you think about all of those things, it's the holistic approach, there's the holistic approach in audio. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's the holistic approach when you drill down in podcasting. And, you know, what we like to talk about um, and the way that we think about ourselves is we are 100% an ad supported platform across all platforms, which is uh, different than some of our more well-known competitors in the audio space. And we feel like that gives us a, a pretty major competitive advantage. Um, we also have a high level of unduplicated audience from a digital standpoint across a lot of our major competitors. So as much as 80% and in some instances 90% of our audience is unique to us, meaning you can't reach those consumers, listeners across other digital audio platforms. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So when you think about the fact that you may not actually even be able to reach those listeners because they're subscription based, there's a really big opportunity with, with Odyssey to reach more of those people. And in a world where reach and frequency is an important thing, um, that's a, a major attribute that we feel like we can bring to the marketplace. Got it. And so getting back to your question though, when I think about holistic audio generally, um, our ability to bring all of those listeners to the marketplace and to our advertisers across podcasting, across, let, let's say as an example, we do a custom segment in podcasting and we do this all the time. Um, we have the ability to distribute that custom segment more broadly across all of our radio stations which enhances the value proposition sure. and expands the audience and reach yeah. for our podcast-driven clients. And that's an interesting opportunity for folks like us. Not everybody has that, the megaphone, if you will, um, of, of over-the-air radio. Uh -huh. But when I think about holistic audio that's driven by podcasting, I almost think about it as a, a triangle where, you know, you have these really in-depth, uh, high-end influencers, which would be our podcasters, and we'll do really unique segments or host reads, whatever it might be. 
And that's sort of at the tip of the pyramid. And I don't care what you say, as big as anybody's podcast is, and podcasts in aggregate are massive, doing individual host reads, there's there's limited reach. So yes. the way to accentuate that um, and thinking holistically is that our ability to reach that, let's say you're trying to reach women 25 to 54, that next level after that host read in that triangle would be targeting women 25 to 54 across our podcast network. Okay. And then take that one step further. We have the ability to target women 25 to 54 across our streaming platform because you can do that within streaming and specifically with us at Odyssey, you can target demographics and psychographics, not only in podcasting, but in streaming. Yep. And then let's take that one step further and you can weave in OTA and that sort of that over base of that over the air, that, that base of that pyramid is our ability to reach t- women 25 to 54. So you have this virtuous cycle in that pyramid. Uh-huh. And that's really how we think about um, holistic audio and working with us holistically. And a number of brands are really leaning into that strategy with us mm-hmm. and are finding success. So, you know, going back in t- to 2021, we did our first really unique study, an immersion study. We had a partner, a research partner in Alter Agents where we looked at how immersive audio was, podcasting, radio, um, OTA, which we call radio, and and streaming versus things like CTV, things like social. And the immersion scores that we received back in audio were much, much higher than TV and and social. You mean like how obsessed i am how deeply time, time spent and engagement okay. yeah t- time spent and, and engagement with that content was much much higher in audio podcasting in particular because it's such a unique media it's such right. a unique um, opportunity to connect with an audience one-to-one with that host and we talk about that all the time so yeah. that study led you to develop what well, uh, what, what that study led us to do is, is to have even more confidence in our holistic audio approach and make our, our advertising partners and our client partners feel even more comfortable, which led to a number of really unique conversations with big holding companies and advertisers in the marketplace around attention metrics overall. So we started with that immersion study, which started to raise some eyeballs, yep. earballs. <laughs> um, whatever you want to call them. And fast forward us to three months ago when we released a study with some of our competitors in the marketplace that was driven by Dentsu really around attention right. and, and how much more effective audio can be even over social and TV and CTV from an attention standpoint, yep. which is really, really unique. And it was groundbreaking and it was the first of its kind. I mean, so much so that Dentsu is now talking about ACPMs or attention CPMs, oh, which well, bodes really well for us absolutely. in the audio space. What a point of differentiation totally. for the whole audio industry. Absolutely. You, you know, it's funny because I love hearing you talk about that. And certainly Brian and Paul in our previous segments mentioned attention and, and qualitative metrics. But even in... Uh, and by the way, they probably did a much better, better job really than did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, don't want to burst your bubble, but yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but at a panel that I heard earlier at Podcast Movement, our friend Gina Garubo of NPR yeah. cited that Dentsu study as well. And so I think the whole industry is really excited about it. And she actually said, pay attention to attention metrics. Yeah, it's so, a thing. It's a real thing. It's a thing. Yeah. Good. And I, and I get, look, I give Dentsu a lot of credit for um, to really stepping up and, and bringing that right. uh, to the marketplace in a, in a big way. And when you think about it, when you look at what happened with the Hollywood strike in 2007, and we're sort of facing that now, yeah. right? Again, what you saw come out of that was a whole new slate of content in reality television that has been here to stay, right? And has become some of the most popular content in the marketplace. It's going to be, I think, really interesting to see what happens with podcasting as this strike continues to go on in in Hollywood. Yes. Because people want content. They're voracious for content. Right. And we're going to be able to continue to pump out and deliver 
a ton of really good, really high quality content that you may not be able to get from Hollywood today. Well, I do have to say that the sole advantage of the writer's strike is that I'm now consuming the back catalog I mm -hmm. always meant to consume. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I when, when you think about the comedy genre and podcasting, and we have a lot of it, Fly on the Wall is a great example with, with Dana Carvey and David Spade. It's an absolutely hilarious show. It is. But when you when you think about the lack of being able yep. to get your late night fix, yep. you know, that's a great opportunity to sample Fly on the Wall and really you know jump in with both feet. Brilliant. Um, so on a, a more advertising, yeah, it's, it's a very technical term. Advertising. Um, I love advertising. Thank you. <laughs> or, or media front, like you, the industry is getting older. Yeah. And <laughs> yes. Thanks for that reminder. Yeah, and wiser. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities that yeah. we're seeing. A lot of people are also talking about like contextual targeting, mm -hmm. but that also brings as we see things mature per what you were talking about earlier and you know, catching yeah. up to the way video evolved. We're also seeing danger zones, yeah. like needing to ensure brand safety. So how's Odyssey approaching things like that in particular with podcasting? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that it's always going to be there. We're actually, and this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, we're working on another study with a major agency that's going to come out pretty soon that I, I think will illustrate the fact that people are choosing to listen to podcasts in, in very unique ways. They're actually going out, they're finding podcasts, they're choosing to listen. Brand safety is not as much of an issue for them mm -hmm. because they're mm -hmm. so connected to those podcasts. They actually love the brands that support their podcasts. That being said, you know, from an advertiser perspective, they want to feel comfortable that their advertising is in a brand safe environment. Right. So what we've done is is we've partnered with a company called Sounder that allows for AI ingestion of our content. And you get an IAB or a GARM score, mm -hmm. which is pretty industry standard. And, you know, quite frankly, across our network, we're 99% brand safe, 99.5% brand safe. The wow. 0.5 is, um, is basically true crime. And uh -huh. look, that's just a space you gotta be in if you wanna reach upscale females. 25 to 54, they love that type of content. And he's, he's and looking at me. Yeah, okay. I'm looking at you and everybody walking down the hall. That's 25 to 50. God bless. I wish. Yeah. And so we're um, incredibly excited about what we're able to bring in the marketplace with Sounder. And to be honest, to date, people are talking about it a lot. And we, we sort of saw this in video. It, it took a while for it to really become a thing. Like we're not missing deals because of brand safety. We're not losing out on revenue because of brand safety, uh -huh. but it's a part of every conversation that we have. Okay. So speaking of deals, tell me about a really cool one that took advantage of yeah. all Odyssey all the time. Sure, sure. There's one in particular um, off the top of my head that, that we're really excited about. We actually have a, a podcast coming out in a few weeks time that we produced with Amy Poehler called Dr. Sheila. Uh -huh. And the whole premise is, is really unique. It's really cool. It happens to be scripted. And so what that afforded us was the opportunity to weave a big grocery brand into the fabric of the, of the content. So yeah. it was really integrated into the content. And so that's one that we're sort of really excited about okay. coming down the pike in a few weeks time. Yeah, that's not branded content that's like no it's it's literally like this brand is integrated or... into the storyline oh that's brilliant yeah. well look at barbie that it, it worked right <laughs> holy yeah. cow did my that my nails work. are bright pink today oh so. you know what i noticed that thank are. you very much yeah. um that's awesome and now will that brand also enjoy some non-podcast extensions so you can sure yeah yeah we we will leverage some of our other platforms including social yeah, so we're excited about that one. Do you unique. ever record that episode live with Amy Poehler? Can I please be in the audience? Abs front row. You'll get the front row. You're in. And hey, Ken LaDonna, <laughs> my new best friend. And also, by the way, the EBP of Digital Sales for Odyssey. That's it. So That's thank it. you so much for joining thank you. and illuminating this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you got some good insider scoop from this episode of Insider Interviews with me, E.B. Moss. 
If you enjoyed this content, please feel free to buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Moss Appeal. And I hope you'll follow insider interviews on social media and let me know if you have a question or a suggestion for a next stellar guest in media marketing and advertising. Speaking of stellar, my theme music was composed and performed by the incomparable Grammy winning John Clayton. If I can help you with your company's podcast, please find me at mossappeal.com. Thanks again for listening.